Um, so good morning. Yes, I'm uh, Bill Nelson. A, my title is computational scientist. Um, I've been at PNNL for about 10 years, and uh, I mostly work on uh, microbial genomics and metagenomics from an environmental context. But I also do dabble in transcriptomics, which is what we're going to talk about today. I'm here to provide you just with a sort of overview of what transcriptomics is, just so we're all on the same page. Um, I'm going to be going from your sample uh, all the way through the generated sequence just to accounts table, which you'll take to do the cool statistics and other data science analysis that we'll talk about later today. Okay. And I got to say, um, after years of pandemic, it's a little weird to be presenting in person and have to look at the screen instead of my laptop. So this is what we're going to talk about in this. Uh, first, we're just going to do briefly what is transcriptomics. We're going to talk about uh, some of the techniques that is, have historically been used to interrogate a transcriptomics which ESC stage microarray, and then we'll spend most of our time talking about RNA-seq because that's what everyone's using these days to do this. We will go over some RNA-seq study design considerations, things you should think about as you're starting your project. Um, and then we'll go through the RNA-seq process, um, things to think about when you're getting ready to do your sample preparation, um, some aspects of how library construction works and what that actually is. We'll go over the Illumina sequencing process, uh, then go through data grooming. Um, how do you actually get your sequence reads ready for the uh, data analysis? And if we have time, which I'm pretty sure we won't, um, I can touch on how long read sequencing works uh, and maybe single cell transcriptomics. So what is transcriptomics? Um, basically put, transcriptomics is just analyzing the complement of RNA in your sample. So it depends on what your sample is. If your sample is a single organism, say you're doing human cell culture or something like that, uh, your RNA is going to be what the human cell is expressing. If you have an environmental sample, uh, your transcriptome is going to be the transcripts that's generated by all the cells in your sample. So that would be considered a metatranscriptome. And transcriptomics is considered an, a, a part of functional genomics. Um, of, so of course, if you just have regular genomics, you're looking at the genes in a cell and that's just, they happen to be there. They're not necessarily doing anything. So this is the next step. These genes are being expressed. They are supposedly contributing positively to the cell responding to whatever its current environmental condition is. Okay, why would you want to do a transcriptomics experiment? Well, maybe you have a new organism and you're just sort of curious as to how it makes its living, uh, you, know, you know, under the uh, conditions in which you isolated it. So you can just run transcriptomics, identify expressed genes, and I will note that this is going to include your non-coding genes. Uh, this can be a complication, your non-coding genes. We'll talk about that a little later. But your ribosomal RNAs, your tRNAs, and certainly um, some of the small regulatory RNAs in eukaryotes were discovered through transcriptomic analysis. You can take this a step further and um, start growing your cell under two different conditions and compare those conditions. And now you're looking at what genes suddenly change their expression when you go to a new condition. So how is the cell responding? What genes are important to uh, the response to that new environmental condition, new carbon source, lower pH, uh, redox state, whatever. And again, uh, you can take this uh, another step and say, okay, well now we know which genes are changing in expression. Um, but now do we see correlations between genes that are changing in expression? So correlated gene expression can signify that the genes are being co-regulated. This could be because they're in the same operon, if you're in a bacterium. Um, it could mean they're just under the control of the same transcriptional regulator. Uh, and so you can determine these regulatory relationships by looking at this co-expression. And uh, if one of the genes that you happen to be, see co-regulated with your genes is a transcriptional regulator itself, then you can make assumptions about whether that is actually the gene that's controlling uh, your other cluster of genes. Another historically important role of transcriptomics is to examine uh, eukaryotic genes and eukaryotic gene structure. Uh, 
Uh, eukaryotic genes, of course, have complex structure uh, with lots of exons and introns and various splice variants and this kind of thing. And it can be, it's still very difficult for the uh, informatic protocols to not just identify, you know, the how the different splice variants occur, but, you know, exactly where the exons are in some eukaryotic organisms or even where the genes are. Um, so uh, transcriptomics can be really important for uh, defining genes in eukaryotic systems. And even in prokaryotes, um, transcriptomics is used to map transcription start sites or to look for alternative promoters that may occur uh, within the context of an operon. You may have a, a second uh, promoter that functions sometimes, and you can detect these things using transcriptomics. All right, so that is sort of a base overview of transcriptomics. Let's talk about some of the ways that people have uh, analyzed a transcriptome. So way back in the bad old days when sequencing was still difficult, uh, they did come up with probably the first way of examining a transcriptome, which was called expressed sequence tags. And in this process, you would uh, isolate your RNA. And then of course, the first thing you do anytime you get RNA out of a cell is you immediately do reverse transcription and turn it into cDNA because RNA is unstable and nobody really wants to work with it. Um, also, if you get to a cDNA stage, now you can do cloning. You can do molecular biology and cloning. And that's what you would do. You would get your cDNAs, you would clone these into a sequencing vector, and you would just do a single sequence read off one end. And you would get uh, literally a tag that was 10 to 20 nucleotides long, right? But this was enough for people to then search against, you know, whatever genomic DNA they had and say, hey, wait a minute, this is an area where a gene is occurring, and this gene is being expressed. So this was the first real insight into being able to look at uh, a transcriptome. It was not terribly quantitative, it was not terribly comprehensive, but it was a start. And it really um, helped with, um, like I said, eukaryotic gene finding in the early days. Uh, a next step up was the serial analysis of gene expression. And this was a slightly more complicated process uh, involving using beads with poly DT tails to pull out your uh, messenger RNAs, and then you use a series of restriction enzyme digests to generate these small tags. Um, and the a nice thing is if you use these restriction enzymes, then you can play my molecular biology tricks and uh, clone these into long arrays uh, inside your clon cloning vectors. And then you can sequence across this entire array. And then also because you were using restriction enzymes, you can predict um, that you would get the same fragments out repeatedly from a gene. And so not only could you use these tags, which are again on the order of you know 10 to 20 nucleotides, really not that long, um, but you could identify the genes. But also if you saw the same fragments repeatedly, you could start to do some rudimentary quantitation. So this was one of the first ways you could actually get changes in gene expression level, or at least relative gene expression levels. So uh, sort of a parallelizing of your EST concept. Um, another big one back in the day, and then it still is used a fair amount, um, is microarray. And for a microarray, the first thing you need to do is generate your probe chip. Um, so you get a glass slide and you just uh, get oligonucleotides synthesized that, are, uh, that will target the genes that you're interested in, and you make spots of those uh, on your glass slide. So each of these little circles is going to represent a whole bunch of oligos that are the same probe for the same gene uh, sitting on your glass slide. Then you have your two samples, your control sample and your experimental sample. You extract your RNA. Of course, you turn it into cDNA. Um, and when you do that, you also fluorescently tag it uh, with a different color. And you can either, as shown here, combine equal amounts of those probes and hybridize them, or you can hybridize one. And then one of the nice things about microarrays, you can strip off the things you just hybridize and reuse the chip. Um, so you could do this in serial. But uh, the genes that are present will hybridize to the uh, chip, and you can read the fluorescence. And if you combine your images here, um, you can see two pieces of information, right? So one is uh, the intensity of the color on the chip uh, or in the image is uh, corresponds to the level of gene expression. So you're getting some level of quantitation. 
The other thing is um, if you have a greener dot in this case, that would be an RNA that's more present in your control sample. If you have a red spot, that's going to be something that's more present in your experimental sample. Uh, and if you see a yellow dot, they're probably about equal between the two samples. So you can look at relative changes between conditions uh, with uh, microarray. Now, the one uh, big advantage of microarray over the previous technologies, it was much more comprehensive. Um, it was much more high throughput than ESTs or SAGE, which required a lot of cloning steps. The drawback to microarray is it's a targeted analysis, right? So you are deciding which genes you're looking for up front. So if there is a gene call that wasn't made in your organism or an exon that you didn't know existed and uh, you performed this experiment, you would never see that. So one drawback. Okay, on to the main event, the reigning champion, RNA-seq. Uh, next generation sequencing made this possible once you got the high throughput, highly parallel sequence generation that was inexpensive. Uh, you could perform this type of analysis. So again, you start with samples, I imagine. Um, you isolate your RNAs. Uh, and once again, you generate cDNA. Now, once you have your cDNAs, you're going to fragment those down and do size selection so you get fragments of a uniform size. We will talk about why you do that a little later in the presentation. Um, you're also going to add linkers. Uh, these include your sequencing primers, your barcodes, which we will also talk some about, about these things during the library prep uh, slide. Uh, and sometimes some other linkers that are involved just in the process of volumic sequencing. And then these, once you have your library prepared, that goes on to your flow cell. Uh, the flow cell does its magic, which we'll also talk about later. Um, you generate a whole bunch of images with little spots on them. And these are processed to give you your sequence reads. Now, once you have your sequence reads, you need to interpret those. So you are going to uh, compare the sequence reads you get back against uh, some reference data set. Uh, this is going to be a collection of genes that you're interested in figuring out what the expression of them is. OK, so that's how RNA-seq works in a nutshell. And like I said, we'll get into some more details later. So let's talk about uh, you've decided to do a transcriptomics experiment because transcriptomics is cool. Um, what are some things you need to think about as you are designing your, uh, how you're actually going to do it? So uh, this up here uh, represents the trade-off we all have because we're scientists, we all have budgets. Um, this is the trade-off between how much money you have and how good science you can do. That's not a penny, that's a Nobel Prize in case you're sitting in the back of the room. Okay, um, and usually for omics experiments, this comes down to your trade-off between the number of samples you can actually run and the depth of sequence, so the amount of sequence you're going to collect per sample. Sequence depth uh, is a very important consideration for your experiment because depending on what your question is and depending on what your sample is, the answer can be either easy or hard to figure out, and the number can be very different. So things that you need to think about. First of all, you need to think about the complexity of your sample. If you're looking at uh, a human cell culture line, you know you have one organism, you know the set of genes you're looking for, this is a pretty defined system, um, and you can probably fairly easily calculate how deep of sequence you need to generate in order to get a good sampling of your transcriptome. If you're working out of a soil sample from the environment, well, now you're talking about thousands to protect, perhaps tens of thousands of organisms. They're present in all different abundances, uh, and you have absolutely no idea what the transcript profiles for any of those organisms are going to look like. This is a much harder question. Um, and when uh, people come to me and say, hey, I'm doing like a soil environmental sequencing transcriptomic experiment, how much sequence do I need? I say, as much as you can afford. Basically, there's no, there's no correct answer there. It's really hard to calculate how much you need to answer your question. So just collect as much as you can. Um, Another thing you need to think about is the total expected length of your transcriptome. So this is essentially, if you think about all, how many genes do you have present and how long are those genes, um, that is the total length of your transcriptome. It's the number of genes times their length. And the length of your genes actually is an important consideration, which we will talk about a little bit later as well. Um, finally, your expected dynamic range of expression. So. Uh, again, going to an example of looking at a human cell culture line, if you, you know, give it a treatment and you're expecting a really huge 
change in the gene expression. You're expecting these genes to really turn on very strongly. Maybe you don't need to sequence so deeply in order to see that effect. However, if you're looking for something that's going to be super subtle, um, or you know, maybe uh, expression of a mutant gene uh, in the background of a number of um, wild type genes, uh, well, then maybe you're going to need to sequence more deeply in order to confidently assert that you're seeing that change. Okay, so that's depth of sequence. Let's talk about number of samples now or replication. Um, we all want to do good science. We all want people to accept our science as correct. In order to do that, we do all the statistics and data science that we'll be talking about later in the day. In order to do that, you need some replication of your experiments to generate that statistical power. And uh, I'm going to say that a good place to start uh, is five biological replicates, more if you can afford it. This will make the data scientists love you if you can provide them with at least five biological replicates. Uh, why five? Um, Transcriptomics is a tricky business. There are lots of steps at which it can fail. Uh, sometimes it's difficult to get the RNA out of the sample correct uh, sufficiently, let's say. Um, library prep can fail, sequencing runs can fail. So uh, I have never seen a, an omics experiment go where all of the samples uh, worked. Um, so prepare to you know, have some fail. And uh, the way to ensure against failure is for more replicates. So if you've got five and you lose one or two, well, you still have three or four samples. That's still decent statistical power. If you're starting with three and you lose one, now you're starting to have difficulty drawing your conclusions. So uh, in practicality, five usually seems like a luxury based on most budgets, um, but that is sort of a good target to shoot for. In terms of technical replicates, um, there are ways you can counteract uh, technical failures or technical variation without really incurring additional expense. Um, you can play games like take your sample, split it, process it in parallel, and then combine it again at the end. Um, the other thing is the more biological replicates you have, uh, that also ensures against technical variation. Another thing you want to think about is what your reference set is going to be at the end of your experiment. Um, usually there's going to be um, one you know, sort of uh, genome sequence that the community uses. That's, you know, like the reference sequence that everyone uses. So that's not always um, what you're concerned about, but sometimes it is, especially if it's something that maybe doesn't have a complete genome sequence. Maybe there's a couple of different things available. You want a reference set that is as applicable to your sample as possible. Um, and the other thing that you want to think about if, in terms of answering your question is not necessarily uh, you know, what the under, underlying nucleotide sequence is, but what's the annotation of that? How good are the gene calls? What types of functional annotation are associated? What's most accepted in your community? What's most comparable against other experiments that have been done? Um, so think about things like that uh, and make sure that you have access to that data before you start. Okay, finally, verification. Transcriptomics is one way to interrogate a system uh, biologically, and it's, it's a bit of an indirect uh, view of how a cell lives because all you're doing is looking at expressed genes, not really biological function. So it's always nice uh, to think about when I get to the end of my experiment and I have these conclusions that I'm drawing from my transcriptomics, what kinds of other experiments can I do to verify these results? That'll shore up uh, your experiment in general and uh, make all of the science better. Okay, experimental design considerations. So now we've designed our experiment, we've run our experiment, we want to do our transcriptomics. Uh, we start with sample prep. Uh, the first thing you want to think about with sample prep is actually extracting your RNA out of your cell. And frequently we are working with samples that um, cost thousands of dollars to uh, get. Maybe you traveled to Alaska and pulled a soil core out of the tundra. Maybe uh, you got a clinical sample from a partner at a hospital that you cannot get again. Uh, RNA prep is tricky and you want to be good at it before you start working with your precious samples. So practice your extraction techniques. If you practice your tricks, uh, extraction techniques and you suck at them, find someone in your lab who's good at it. Buy them dinner, convince them to prep your RNA for you. Uh, precious samples are precious for a reason. Uh, so 
uh, make sure that you are very confident that you can get the RNA out that you need to before you start. Stabilization of samples, um, transcript profiles can start changing very rapidly. If you're doing environmental sampling, you pull something out of the frozen tundra, suddenly it's not frozen anymore. The cells respond to that. They say, oh, wait, I'm in a different environment. Let me start changing my gene expression. Um, also, if you have samples sitting around, RNA can degrade fairly quickly. So to control for that, you want to do things like snap freeze your samples as soon as you get them out, um, or use chemical treatments like RNA later, uh, which does a good job of shutting down enzymes that are either going to produce or degrade RNAs. Uh, and that will uh, preserve your RNA for its trip to wherever you're going to do the rest of the um, processing steps. Think about contamination. Uh, if you're out in the field, there's all sorts of ways that things can contaminate your sample and start to muddy your conclusions. Uh, even if you're doing clinical stuff, if you're take, doing like human microbiome work, you're guaranteed to have human contamination in those microbiome samples. And that can actually dominate uh, your sequencing. We were recently doing it, it was metagenomic sequencing, but 90% of the sequence that came out of this was human. And it's always really disappointing to, you know, get your sequence back and throw out 90% of it before you start your analysis. So think about ways you can minimize contamination in sort of however you're doing it then. Okay, uh, now we'll get down to the uh, contaminant that is ribosomal RNA. Ribosomal RNA in uh, RNA complements of cells is quite high. It can be 98% of the sequence, or not the sequence, but the RNA that's, that's in your cell. And unless that's what you want the sequence. If you're looking for gene expression, you don't really want to look at ribosomal RNAs. So how do we get rid of them? There's two techniques. Uh, poly-A enrichment works for eukaryotes. They've got that nice poly-A tail on their messages. You can leverage that using a poly-DT primer and some beads, and you can pull out all of your message, or not all of your message, but you can at least enrich for your message relative to your RNA using a technique like that. Uh, in prokaryotes, you have to go the other direction, RNA depletion. Um, now you have primers attached to your bead that are complementary to conserved regions of the ribosomal RNA, and you use that to pull that away from things that are not ribosomal RNA. And uh, I, would, I would suggest you consider doing this anytime you can. The only time you might not be able to do uh, one of these types of enrichments is if you have very low material coming back out. Anytime you do a step like this, uh, there's only so, so good a recovery that you get. So if you have vanishingly small amounts of RNA to start with, uh, you just may not be able to do it because you'd end up with nothing. Okay, library prep. So library prep is all of the steps that take you from your raw RNA to what's gonna go on to the sequencer. The method's gonna depend on your choice of sequencing technology. Um, again, the first thing you do is cDNA synthesis. Uh, DNA is just more stable and it allows you to do all of the cloning steps or molecular biology magic uh, that is the rest of library prep. Uh, again, you're gonna do your fragmentation and size selection. So why do we do this? So uh, if you think about um, the sequencing process, you are sequencing the sequence, the number of uh, nucleotides you're generating is fixed, right? So you say, I want 150 base pair reads. I want 250 base pair reads. So that's going to be a fixed number. And if you're doing paired end sequencing, you're sequencing 250 nucleotides from this end and 250 nucleotides from this end. So the maximum amount of sequence you're going to get out of any fragment you're trying to sequence is 500 nucleotides. So why not build your library so that the fragments are about 500 nucleotides? That way you have the most efficiency, the most efficiency in terms of what your library construction is relative to what the sequence you're generating. That's the reason you do your fragmentation and size selection. Okay, uh, after you fragment, now we need to start putting on the bits that actually allow the sequencing to occur. So you're gonna ligate on primers and adapters, um, including the sequencing primer sites. Uh, if you're gonna do multiplexing, and um, just since this is an introduction, we'll talk about what multiplexing is. Uh, multiplexing is a technique that allows you to run multiple samples in the same sequencing lane. You tag all of the same uh, sequences, or tag all of the fragments that you're generating with the same barcode, which is a short, um, unique DNA sequence. And then you can mix that together with samples that have different barcodes on them. You sequence them all together, and on the far end, you can use 
uh, informatics to then separate out uh, the sequences that you generated based on those barcodes. Okay, that's multiplexing. So if you're going to do that, this is the step where you attach your barcode. Finally, you can perform an amplification step, and this can serve two purposes. One is you've just done a lot of molecular biology. Sometimes molecular biology doesn't work the way you want it to, and you get some incorrect constructs. If you're amplifying for stuff that's correct, then you enrich for stuff that's correct, right? Uh, also, if you have low input, amplification can uh, increase the amount of material you have so that the uh, the rest of the sequencing process occurs more efficiently. Finally, uh, we get to the sequencing step, and this is Illumina sequencing, which many of you may be familiar with, but if you're not, we'll go over it here. Um, again, we have our fragments that we generated, and we've done our library construction and added our adapters. Um, for Illumina, you have two different primers that are on different ends of your fragment. And uh, on the flow cell, you have complementary uh, oligos that do both of those primers. So you let, as you flow your DNA onto the flow cell, one or the other end will hybridize to the flow cell. Uh, and then because DNA is just a little floppy string, it'll flop over and the other end will hybridize to the other primer that's present on the flow cell. And you do a synthesis reaction, and now you have two strands attached. And uh, importantly, they are close to each other, right? So this is another reason you want relatively short fragments is so that as you repeatedly uh, have the DNA flop over and synthesize, you wind up with these little patches of all of the same sequence uh, in a close cluster on the flow cell. And this is basically to amplify your signal. So as you go on to do your uh, sequencing by synthesis, and you incorporate your fluorescent nucleotides, um, the fact that you have a whole bunch of them all together makes it easier for the camera to detect that. Okay, so then you actually do your sequencing by synthesis. Every time you flow on a new nucleotide, a picture is taken, and uh, the color shows you which nucleotide was incorporated uh, at each given spot. You generate four or 500 of these images, and then uh, algorithms go through and do the base calling analyze all the images and tell you what the sequence is. Okay, so now you have your sequence. Um, there are some places where the sequencing reactions uh, can go wrong. Um, you might imagine various ways that the bridge amplification could come up with spots that are not pure. Um, so you'll have different sequences and you'll get confused signal out. Um, if you're doing longer sequencing reads, you can imagine that uh, the synchronization of the sequencing might uh, get out of phase the longer you go. And you, again, you're starting to see dirty signal coming from uh, your sequencing reactions. And so you want to do a quality analysis on your sequence reads once you're done with your sequencing. And this is common to any sequencing technology. Um, there are tools that allow you to analyze this. This is a figure from a, an image from a program called FastQC, which is a nice, uh, easy way to look at some of your sequence data or your sequencing run. And so what this image is showing us here is the position in base pairs along the read. So this was a 250 nucleotide sequencing run. And um, on the y-axis, we've got the quality score uh, that has been calculated for each of those bases. That's essentially you know, how, how good was the signal, how pure was the color that was coming from uh, each of the images that was coming out. And this is uh, an average, this line represents an average across all of the reads that were generated for this sequencing run. And this is a really good sequencing run. It actually looks really good. All of, his, all of our uh, positions have quality scores that average above 28, which is usually a nice cutoff. Um, here you can see that as you get farther along, it does start to tail off a little bit, but it's still very strong. Um, so this would be a good sequencing run. Um, and you would have no, no issues saying, hey, let's move ahead with our analysis. If you have something that looks like this, um, here we have all of our quality scores are either in the middle or sort of tailing down into the red. Um, this is probably a failed sequencing run. And that would be one where you just throw out that entire uh, data set. Um, but you can use these quality scores to uh, groom your sequence, make it better, make it optimal for your downstream analysis. 
Uh, and so we'll talk about the, the sequence grooming um, now. So uh, we just talked about the uh, quality scores. And so you can trim each individual read. Um, the file that you get out, the FASTQ file, has the sequence and the quality scores associated with it. Programs will go through saying, oh, these reads at the end, or these sequence, these nucleotides at the end have low quality. We're just going to trim those off, make a slightly shorter sequence, and they'll return that. Uh, this will make your data better. You also need to, and I forgot to put this in here, if this is also the step where you're going to demultiplex your samples um, before you do your adapter trimming. <laughs> because you require your barcodes to do the demultiplexing. So this is where you separate out. If you had uh, uh, sequences from different samples, these would be filtered into different files. Then you can do your adapter trimming. This will pull off any sequence um, that was part of the process and not part of your experiment. So if there's any sequencing primer sequence in there, there shouldn't be, but sometimes there is. Uh, if you have barcodes, if you have any of those other tags that were important for attaching the uh, fragments to the flow cell. Those will all be, again, just chopped off the sequence. You can do a low complexity screen. This is usually built into the trimming software. Uh, sequencing, when it fails, has a tendency to do things like give you a big long string of A's or something like TA, 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 and you look at it and you're like, that's not a gene. Well, you can filter that out with your low complexity screen. And then this is another location or another step where you can screen for your contaminants. You can say, please tell me where all the ribosomal RNA is and just filter that out into some other file. Or you can screen against a host if you're coming out of a, like a human microbiome sample. You can screen against human genome and pull out all the reads that are aligned to the human genome that you're not interested in. Okay, now it is time. We have our, our very pretty sequences uh, and they're ready to align against our reference. Um, again, it's best if your reference is you know, uh, as, as congruent to your sample as possible. So, uh, you know, if you're working in a system where it's a human, uh, you've got the, the human reference sequence that you're going to go against. But if you have an environmental sample, uh, it's really best to try and have a metagenome that was generated from the same sample that you've assembled and done gene calling on, and that's what you want to map back against. Um, if you don't have that, it's not the end of the world, but it's certainly easier to do the analysis if you do have something like that. The reference is going to be the genes, not the genome. Um, I, I guess you could align against the genome, but then you would have to go back and deconvolute where all the genes are on the genome. Why not just search against the reads and quantitate directly, right? Um, if you have concerns about the fact that searching against genes is a targeted analysis and there might be stuff that you miss, when you get to the end of your search against your reference and you've got things that didn't align to your gene set, you can always go back and align those against your genome and say, you know, if you get significant, you know, hits in one region, maybe you're going to say, this looks like it might be a new exon or this might be a new gene entirely. Uh, and this is just to say that, you know, there are fast aligners out there that do this. You're aligning, you know, hundreds of millions of reads against this thing. It's going to take a while. But these uh, things like uh, BWA or Bowtie 2 leverage exact matches uh, and allow you to do it in a not unreasonable amount of time. Okay, you can also do reference free analysis. This is possible, but it's a little trickier and it's got its limitations. So you can take your reads that were generated from your transcriptomics and you can assemble those uh, and then you know, identify genes within those assembled sets from your transcriptome itself and then just map your reads against that and look at sequence coverage and, and do your quantitation that way. Um, that works if you don't have a good genome sequence or no genome sequence at all. Uh, but again, it is a little more complicated to do. So your alignment against your reference looks something like this. So this blue thing represents a gene, the YOLO gene or something. Uh, these little gray arrows represent all of your sequence reads that are aligned against that. So this is just a pile of considered a pileup. This is not actually showing all of the reads that are mapped. And this histogram is just sort of showing uh, on a per nucleotide level, how many reads cover each of these nucleotides. And this is fairly standard profile for gene coverage. Um, it's not something that comes up and is flat and then drops off. You always see this sort of variation in terms of the, uh, the coverage for the gene. And it always tails off uh, at the ends of the gene. 
Um, but this is this is essentially the data that you're getting out. This is your counts right here. It's just like how many of these reads mapped against this gene. Um, it gets a little trickier with eukaryotes again because of their complex gene structure. Depending on the question you're trying to answer, you may want to quantitate in different ways. So you may want to quantitate by gene uh, or exon or transcript, right? So here's a representation of this gray box of one gene that's got four exons and it generates three different transcripts. Well, um, you could say anything that hits any of these exons, we're just going to count that because I'm interested in how often this gene is used. If you're interested in, uh, you know, if you know that a particular exon goes into one splice variant that is, you know, under the condition that you're interested in, or you want to look at the relative, um, uh, the, the frequency at which different exons wind up in the final transcript, then maybe you want to quantitate by exon. If you want to quantitate by transcript, it gets a little trickier um, because, you know, it's easy to say, oh, you know, a read hits any one of these pieces or it specifically hits one of these. But if you want to look at uh, transcripts, you need to leverage the reads that um, hit the splice sites, right? And then do some back calculation to try and figure out uh, how much, how what the abundance of the transcript is specifically versus another transcript. And I don't know if that's getting covered later, but, but maybe. Um, I'm going to touch on normalization here, uh, although you will hear more about this later. And uh, to be quite honest, there are some downstream analyses packages which say, please do not give me normalized data. Um, but things to think about uh, in terms of normalization are uh, your data sets are going to come out in different sizes, right? You can, every sequence run returns a different number of reads. So you do need to normalize by your data set size. And that's usually in per million reads. You also need to normalize by your target length. Um, that, that means target in this case is gene. Um, so a 600 nucleotide gene is going to have twice as many reads that can map to it as a 300 nucleotide gene. So you need to uh, normalize by the length of your genes. And this is usually in a per kilobase of gene length. And three common normalization schemes that you probably have seen if you've done any transcriptomics are the RPKM or reads per kilobase per million, um, which first uh, normalizes the data set. Uh, then looks at the number of reads mapped per target and then normalizes by the gene length. You have your FPKM, which is fragments per kilobase per million. This is essentially the same thing as your RPKM. It's just that if you're doing paired end sequencing, if both read pairs map to the same gene, it only counts as one instead of two to try and control for paired end sequencing. So, you know, the, the other situation would be if you had a paired end where one gene maps to one gene and another, the other one maps to a second gene, uh, then you, each of those genes would get one count. But if they both map to the same one, that gene gets two counts, and that seems unfair somehow. So um, fragments per kilobase per million. And then a uh, newer one is transcripts per million. Um, and essentially, uh, it's it, the same concepts just applied in a different order. Um, and the advantage of TPM is that the way it's calculated, if you sum up the TPMs uh, for each sample in your experiment, they should all sum up to the same number. So that makes them more readily comparable uh, between samples within an experiment. So you will probably hear more about all of these later. OK. We have arrived at the end of our analysis for this stage. Uh, we have generated our counts table. Uh, it's going to look something like this. Generally, this is the convention where you've got your genes as your rows and your experiments as your columns. And you just have in there either your raw counts or your normalized counts. And this is what you're going to take to uh, the next step, which is your data analysis. And how am I doing on time? I'm a little over, okay, well then, I'm a little early. Well, we started a little early too. So, okay, well then then I will, um, if, if you, so long read sequencing, there is some work being done in transcriptomics and long read sequencing. It's not happening a lot yet, uh, but it is starting. Um, so if you're curious about how these different long read technologies work, so this would be the PAC bio sequencing. Um, PAC biosequencing is actually very similar to Illumina sequencing in that it's a sequencing by synthesis reaction. But instead of making uh, little spots on their flow cell, what they've managed to figure out how to do is make these super high density arrays of wells 
that are small enough that only a single uh, molecule will fall down inside that. And they can actually have this detectors sensitive enough that they can look at that single incorporation event. Um, and so uh, as you do the sequencing by synthesis, you get a fluorescence pulse from each of these, um, I don't know what they call their, their wells, like ZMWs or something like that. But uh, this is how PacBio is working. It's just similar to Illumina, just in these micro wells. And that uh, allows them to flow more nucleotides at once and generate more sequence. Okay, then your nanopore sequencing is uh, an entirely different beast. Um, does not do sequencing by, by synthesis. Uh, you have a film that has these pores that they've built into them. Your DNA uh, is uh, complexed with another protein that fits down on this pore and just feeds your DNA strands down through. And they basically have an electric current that's running across this membrane and the uh, nucleotides as they pass through interrupt the current to different degrees. Uh, and it's so that it's this interruption of the current that's basically being profiled. It's crazy. I, it's, this should not work. There's no way that this works, but it does. Um, the base calling for this is a lot more complicated. Tape requires a lot more computation because it's a whole um, uh, machine learning thing to try and figure out what the base calls are. But uh, because um, it's not a sequencing by synthesis, you're not requiring input of nucleotides for this. Uh, there's not really an upper limit on the read length for this. They've generated like multiple megabase reads. Um, that takes a long time, but you can do it. Uh, so that's your nanopore sequencing. And then finally, um, single cell transcriptomics. Uh, there are various techniques for isolating your cells. Uh, there's laser capture. You can use microfluidics to separate out single cells using oil, um, or you can do facts again, uh, separating things out. Once you have uh, a cell in that's isolated, you can. Uh, one of the techniques that's used is you include these beads that have uh, handles that will uh, hybridize to your RNA uh, and capture it, and then you can pull out those beads. Uh, and they, they will have barcodes on them as well. Um, so once you break out the droplet and do the rest of the process and sequence it, each of these beads will be from will be capturing um, RNA from a single cell, and you can just move ahead and multiplex that and sequence it. 